Okay, great so far. Hello, everybody. Um, next up is Zev Torres. You there, Zev? Can't hear you yet. I could ask to unmute you. Okay, should be okay. Good? Yeah. Cool. Oh, beautiful for heroes proved in liberating strife, who more than self their country loved and mercy more than life. Hold the applause, hold the questions. Until attendance has been taken, credentials have been checked. It is confirmed that all the tuition has been paid. Yesterday's assignments have been collected and everyone has had an opportunity to review the updated syllabus. Until the presentation is concluded, and the applause has died down, and the students have had a few moments to collect their thoughts and share their impressions with one another, giving our venerable speakers time to slip out the side exit before being pressured to account for their dubious methods. America, America, God, mend thine every flaw, confirm thy soul and self-control, thy liberty in law. Thanks. Thank you, Zev. Outre, Zev. Thank you very much. <laughs> Next up from Long Island as well is Margaret Wall. Are you there, Margaret? I can ask to unmute you. Are you there, Margaret? You can unmute yourself. Okay. Hello. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, can you hear now? Okay, yeah. good. Lunar pilgrimage with Chazia. Hussein is from me and I from Hussein, Prophet Mohammed, walking two to three days, 80 kilometers, this religious pilgrimage from Nazareth to Kabbalah. Shazia with thousands walk in freedom. Bystanders make bread in barrels, hand out water, kiss the feet of the walkers. Symbolic for a time, weapons were placed down, allowing the walk of the free. Men, women, families celebrate a prophet. Not frightened this once war torn place, we witness the unity of people safe in Iraq. Her videos show a shrine the size of a concert arena. Peace walks in sand. Next year's walk depends on the phases of the moon. Thank you very much, Murph. Thank and every you. Cheers. Nice to see you again. Nice to see you too. Okay, next up is Michael Schwartz. Are you there, Schwartzy? You might have to unmute yourself. I can't see you on the list, but I did see you. Or have you gone? Linda, did you see him? I did see him earlier. I don't see him now. He might right. have, we can come Maybe back to him. Back. Yes, so next up will be Michelle Carlo. Is Michelle there? Michelle. I'm here. Can you okay. hear me? We can hear you now. Yes, go ahead. All right. All right. My fire New York City. They, the faceless ones, say that if you play with fire, you will get burned. But I beg to differ because I have played with fire my entire life and suffered not even one singed hair. Because I'm a native New Yorker. And no matter how long you've lived here, no matter how much of a New Yorker you think you've become, you'll never know the New York I know. The real New York with junkies and bums and drunks, graffiti and garbage and punks. I mean real punks, not those pseudo skinhead tribal tattooed trustafarians that come slumming in from Connecticut every summer, those crusty foot ones. I mean real punks. Like Joey Ramone, he was from Forest Hills. And if you knew what growing up in what you would call a small town, but we call a hood could do to you, you would know why New York is the birthplace of both hip hop and punk. The New York I know is a whirling incendiary creative supernova that fueled Walt Whitman, Marianne Muir, Nora Ephron, Spike Lee, Betty Smith, Perry Thomas, Lou Reed, Laura Nairo, Notorious B.I.G. and thousands of others, both famous and infamous. The New York I know had knock hockey, Scully, and Manhunt, Brentano's Bookstore, Unique Clothing Warehouse, and Azuma, Dr. Pepper Concerts, Tad Steaks, Orange Julius Theater 80, 
and real live artists living in Soho. In my New York, we used to cut class and ride the subway, the number six train, all the way down to Greenwich Village. It was like the Highlander back then. There was only one. And we'd sit on someone's stoop with our Newport line to ask us for directions just so we could say, fuck you. In my New York, we used to cut class and ride the subway down to Greenwich Village. It was like the Highlander back then. There was only one. And in my New York, kids wore the proud scars of playground battles. Lumpy foreheads, scabby knees, missing fingers. Hey, there was no padding under the monkey bars back then, but there were broken Rheingold bottles. No, not the trendy microbrew sipped by goateed hipsters, but the swill guzzled by old men with no teeth who would die soon. Yeah, there were broken bottles and used needles. And if you fell off a swing and broke something, hey, it was your fault because you were a pussy, a mama's child, a douchebag with sweaty palms and no heart whose mama made you wear skips. And who are you going to sue anyway? No one's dad wore a suit to work. Those are only for funerals. And if he wore one otherwise, then your daddy was a douchebag too. There were no cell phones in my New York. Your moms threw you out the house at 8.30 in the morning and you came back when you got there. It's 10 p.m. Do you know where your children are? The hell you do, because they're at Orchard Beach, they're at Coney Island, they're in the parking lot at the Bronx River Projects, watching a skinny ass kid with a boom box under a street light who doesn't yet know that he is going to be Grad Master Flash. In my New York, seven kids would share a soda, ate a piece of gum, we called it ABC, already been chewed. And if you dropped it, you kissed it up to God and you stuffed that shit right back in your mouth. Cause no one ever got sick, what was sick? Sick was what happened to your abuelo who threw her chancletas at you because she caught you stealing her Bacardi 151 again. Sick was what they tried to make you when they sent you to your cousin's house when they all had the German measles and they told you get in the bed with them and kiss them but you never got sick. You had a cold beer on a hot summer's day, a second plate of roast pernil with tostones if you were hungry and you finished your meal with a cafe con leche and a cigarette. And if you happened to be seven months pregnant at the time, so the fuck what? Speaking of coffee, there was no Starbucks. Iced coffee was what happened when you left your cup on the fire escape. Times Square was a place you stayed away from. Bad neighborhoods were bad neighborhoods. There was no Park Slope South or Williamsburg East or Harlem Heights. The D and Avenue D, now that stood for death and drugs. Now you spend $300 on weed and think you scored. In the New York I knew, you got 10 droids to a dime bag. Yeah, that's right, 10. And if you didn't, you'd go right back and call that dealer a fucking retard. Except you can't say retard anymore. And that's what New York has become. A place where you can't eat a cheeseburger if you're pregnant. Where now all prisons are homes because of the COVID and the fucking iced coffee cost five fucking bucks. Do I sound bitter? I don't mean to. I'm actually hopeful. Because I was forged in New York City fire. When phones were in the kitchen and water came from faucets. When a tree grew in Brooklyn, a rose in Spanish Harlem, and Rosie is still and always will be the queen of Corona. And no matter how much they, the faceless ones, try to suck out all the oxygen and drain off all the piss and vomit, no matter how much high tech foam they try to pump over us, the raging creative eternal fire that is New York City. The ones that some of us risk our lives for and others have died for will never ever die. Because in that fire is freedom. The freedom to ignite anything your mind can spark and go wherever the smoke and embers take you. I know, because I've lived my entire life on the lip of the volcano and survived to tell you about it. Because I'm from New York City, where every night is Saturday night, the party starts when we get there, get the fuck out of our way. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. Crackerjack. That was Crackerjack. <laughs> um, I see Michael Schwartz has turned up now. So, Michael, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Yeah, you're here? Okay. People. Go ahead, Schwartzy. <laughs> right at the perfect time, I guess. Okay. Well, no, you were late. Oh, okay. Uh, I knew... I knew my father was not only the fastest driver on the road, but also the best driver, and we were completely safe. In his superhero hands, nothing bad could ever happen to us. I don't know if he drove so fast to get there before I had another accident, but I knew that we would never be in an accident. He was too fast for an accident to catch us. Accidents were, were for people still stuck on the ground. The only thing that ever slowed him down was when we got stopped by a Maryland state trooper for speeding after crossing state lines on our way to see our first hockey game at the Capitol Center. 
My father's anger about being stopped suddenly turned into quiet respect as the tall, shadowy figure approached the car and then looked us over. I recognized something in him right away, but couldn't put my finger on it and then realized I was seeing my own reflection in his dark mirrored sunglasses he was wearing even though it was nighttime. I got the creepy feeling he could read my mind and that he knew I knew his secret. I was the only one who knew that behind those shades were the, were the wide wet eyes of a frightened child trying desperately to hold in his tears. He was silently crying out to me to save him from what was eating away at his insides. He tried, he clenched every pulsating muscle in his body but he just couldn't hold it in anymore. He reached for his gun, pulled it out, pointed it at us, and tossed it back over his shoulder away into the blackness of the woods beyond the shoulder of the highway, unfastened his belt, let it drop to his ankles, ripped off his shirt to reveal his glistening ripped torso, gyrated his hips, rubbed the bulge inside his tight striped state trooper pants up against the car window, and whipped it out. An umbrella! He opened it up and twirled it around over his head and burst into song. It's raining men, hallelujah, it's raining men. I hope hockey is as good as this, I thought to myself. I spotted my reflection in his glasses again and was startled by how wide open my mouth was. How stupid I look. I closed my eyes. When I opened them again, his shirt was on and buttoned, his belt was on and fastened, his gun was in its holster, his umbrella was gone, and my mouth was closed. As he tilted his head, I caught glimpses in his glasses of my family and saw that their mouths were closed too, except for Gary's. And then I realized it wasn't the policeman's secret I knew. It was my brother's. Did you know you were doing over 80, sir? Oh, I'm sorry, officer. I, I, I didn't want my boys to miss the face off. That was it, I thought. Now I'm going to lose my father forever. They're going to take him away from us and we won't even get to spend summers with them. Then the disco cowboy cop asked for my father's license and registration. As we watched him walk back to his patrol car like John Wayne swishing his tight end back and forth like a dainty dancing marionette puppet, my father cursed under his breath about the ticket he just got and I swore under my breath to do a better job next time defending against enemy fighters. He drove under the speed limit the rest of the way, but the next time it was like it never happened. We were addicted to speed. And then one day when I was 15, riding in my father's car again, I discovered my fingers doing something strange, digging into my seat. And when I looked back at the poor suckers in the other cars, it was the silently mouth, help! I feared for my life. That was the moment I realized, maybe superheroes shouldn't be driving. Let Robin take the wheel for a while. Birds have better vision than bats. Take a little rest and let Kenny drive. So I gave up speed, cold turkey. I fastened my seatbelt, hung up my helmet, and like Yosarian, declared myself insane, which meant I was sane, and that in my father's eyes, I was looking more and more like a nut. In the wake of Saturday night fever, I'd spent two years in front of the mirror, feverishly blow drying and brushing my hair, just another pubescent pawn in the late 70s South Brooklyn army of wannabes, until it was so feathered back, I looked like a cockatoo with pimples. But then when I was 14, my head spun around and I decided I had to grow my hair down to my shoulders, even though long hair on boys had long been out of style in my neighborhood. And I knew I would be taunted and scorned by all the other kids of all ages, all sexes and all ethnicities. I didn't discriminate. My friends thought I lost my mind. My father, who hadn't lived with us since I was three or four, threatened to come over in the middle of the night, slip into my room with a pair of scissors and cut it off, cut it all off while I was sleeping. To this day, I stay up all night before going to bed. One day, when my father was over for a brief visit to deliver some steaks or something, Kenny and a couple of friends and I were watching Roger Daltrey running shirtless across the TV screen in the expurgated version of Tommy on the 430 movie singing, I'm free, I'm free, and I'm waiting for you to follow me. Threw a field of wildflowers right into the pesticide spray of the gas mask covered farm workers, then through the woods right into the bullet spray of the gas mask wearing soldiers until he gets to the beach and runs across the sand and into the ocean. And I said, he has long hair. When you have as much money as he does, you can have long hair too, my father replied with a self-satisfied smirk. 
Kenny's impeccably well-groomed buddy, Michael Litwin, the most narcissistic neighborhood bully of Luna Park, sucked up to my father and laughed like an idiot. In my mind, I, I mocked Litwin's laugh, tore off my shirt, and bolted to the beach to run with Roger. Instead, I just stood there looking stupid. The movie cut to a commercial, and I became a junior high school truant. And when my class-cutting cohorts, all of whom were much bigger delinquents than I was and much less literate, finally started going back to school, I didn't because I'm not a quitter. When I do something, I need to do it all the way or not do it at all. It got so bad that my partner in crime, Howie Meltzer, didn't even know what happened to me. He thought I must be ill, maybe even in the hospital again. He ran into my grandfather and asked him how I was. What do you mean? My grandfather shot back in his Yiddish accent. Oh, uh, I... I, I I, I didn't mean anything. I got to go. It, it, it was nice to see you, Mr. 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 Michael's Grandpa Max. Bye. And he took off in the other direction. My grandfather told my grandmother. My grandmother told my mother. And from the look on her face when she got home from work, I had a feeling my long vacation was over and that I wasn't going to be enjoying the dinner conversation that night. Thank you. Thank you. YMCA fever dream, Michael Schwartz. Oh, yeah. Okay, um, next up is Creighton Blinn, and, uh, and on deck is Vicky Iorio. So if Creighton isn't around and I don't see his name, then Vicky, it's up to you. If anybody's there. Okay. I'm un I have unmuted myself. Vicky, yeah, you're there. Hooray. Okay. I didn't say I didn't love him. He promised me a lady's pearl handle 22 if I married him. Next time you're in Cleveland, look up Jimmy, the best man at my wedding, living an Andy Hardy life with his wife in Shaker Heights, which I hear is the bomb, like Long Island's North Shore or the Hamptons. Tani without Tony, my Italian husband, who thinks hydroponic tomatoes are the work of the devil. Only shit in the soil can grow the real thing. He makes his own wine and plucks figs from the tree in our Brooklyn backyard. You think this is as idyllic as being the wife of a sheep herder who looks like Liam Neeson on some island dot off the thumbnail of Scotland. After 10 years of marriage, he wants to do me doggy style on the living room floor while he watches the Mets. My therapist calls this the marital tipping point. He calls it a double header matinee. I'd like to slit his cock open with a glass shard for my Chardonnay, but he belts me first and I call my, and I call my shiner with a frozen steak. I am buying a bus ticket to Cleveland. Jimmy's wife said he'll set me up. She'll set me up in an apartment with furniture from her basement and a cuckoo clock that does not judge. Thank you. Thank you. Visceral, visceral. Okay. The next one up is Jeff Rose. And if Jeff's there, I'll be very grateful. And after him, it will be Michael Anton. So, Jeff, are you around? It'd be nice to see you. You just unmute yourself if you can. I'm here. Hooray. Hi, Jeff. Hello. Where's this this is called. Have you got a cardigan on? Yeah, this is called Flavor. It's been edited for time and revised for the times, but it's the same bullshit. I want to spend as little time as possible at my general practitioner's office. My yearly checkup arrived right before the pandemic began, and now they demand we review my, my lab results in person. I don't want to go. Can we use telehealth, I ask? His staff insists. His office is crowded, his waiting area draped in plastic coverings. The examination room undoubtedly crawls with the invisible disease of previous patients. I wear two masks gloves, and I begrudgingly remove my coat for a blood pressure test. My doctor is chatty. His every word bursts with escaping microscopic pathogens. I guess my blood doesn't have enough vitamin D. My doctor asks how much I've been drinking. Are you serious? 
I say. You made me travel through the pandemic soup of the subway system to ask about vitamin D? Are you trying to kill me? He turns and taps on his computer, which I'm fine with. Breathe in another direction, people. The, med the medical science may be iffy. Still, I believe that if no one faces me, I'll never get sick. I could look at Bax and live forever. And yet he turns around to threaten my survival again. He says there's one more diagnostic test. My doctor suggests that I eat some of myself. I, I, I hate to ask because you'll talk more, I say, but, but what, eat myself? We've taken a tissue swab of your cheek and sent it to a lab upstate, he says, his excitement undoubtedly giving greater flight to any airborne bacterium. They grew a bigger sample and sent it back two weeks ago. All you do is eat it and tell me what you taste like. My doctor bounces on the balls of his feet as he talks. His wild gestures fan the air. I shrink away on the examination table, trying not to inhale. I'd pinch my nose if I wasn't terrified of touching my face. You don't even have to know what your disease tastes like. He talks faster and faster. You should taste familiar. Do you know what the flavor of your own tongue is? No, no, you, you spent your whole life tasting yourself without realizing it. So your sample should taste like nothing to you. If you taste familiar, you're healthy. If you don't, well, that's usually a sign of sickness. Fine, I try to move on as quickly as possible. Can you ship the Jeff sample to my apartment so I can eat it there? That's the good news, my doctor said. We already had the sample made. It's a routine checkup thing now with all the other tests in case we need it later. We keep a meat locker in the back. Okay, 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 I say. I'll just eat it. I've spent 28 minutes now steeping whatever illness lurks in this room. So let's do this so I can go home and shower and drink two glasses of emergency C and burn all my clothing. His entire support staff enter, bringing with them an already prepared Petri dish with a long thin slice of raw cloned Jeff meat. I wonder why they are all ready and so eager. But there's no time for questions. I pick up the bite of me with my fingers, pull both my masks down and drop myself in my mouth hole. I'm mushy and tasteless. It's disappointing this flavor of well-being. I'm worried about being sick, being poisonous or rancid. Instead, I find myself to be a bland and soft nothing, easily swallowed. I taste nothing, I say. My doctor and his staff breathe audible sighs of relief, a chorus of ventilators blowing contagions directly into my face. Why? My doctor explains. Last week, we accidentally gave your sample to another patient, a restaurant critic. She was ecstatic. She called you delightful and luscious. So we had to try a bit ourselves. You, Jeff Rose, are the most delicious person we've ever tasted. You are a delicacy bursting with unexpected and incredible character. We just needed to know whether we were tasting contamination or true quality. You, sir, are grade A, with or without vitamin D. And with that, we scheduled a follow-up appointment for next March, and they took a lunch break to make sandwiches. I can't say I wasn't flattered. However, imagining that I was the best tasting person hasn't helped carry me through quarantine. Whether I taste great or not, I spend my time like any other less palatable shut-in, isolated, breathing only my own air, filling only my own time, knowing although I may never fully appreciate myself, I have to subsist on only me. Thank you. Thank you. Delicious rose like an angel crying on your tongue. Mm. Okay, um, so Michael Anton, if you're there, and after Michael, it will be Holly Hep Galvin. So Michael, can you unmute yourself? Now, now can you hear me? Yep, we can hear you. I thought I'd unmuted myself. Subway submissions, part one. There is a man in late middle age seated across from me. He is absorbed in a book with the title either Kama or Kaba. I can't quite make it out. I cannot tell if he resembles the Russian composer Prokofiev because I do not know what Prokofiev looked like. I suppose I could Google Prokofiev and find out. The only classical composer whose features I'm familiar with are Beethoven's. I think most people are like me in that regard. 
He is wearing a red plaid woolen hunter's cap and his glasses are perched atop his head. Like me, he needs to remove his glasses in order to read. His glasses have side things of plastic to protect his eyes, making them almost look like safety glasses. Perhaps he works around machinery or power tools, maybe a high school shop teacher. Part two, I'm standing by the door on the express side, which will not open for several stops, when a mother and daughter Latina pair enter on Spring Street, mom about 30, daughter about 12. They sit down and take Lay's potato chip bags from plastic bags that they are each carrying. In a simultaneous movement, they both open their bags. The opening of the bags makes just one sound, not two. That's how highly synchronized it was. Daughter, barbecue chips, mom, sour cream and onion. Part three, I'm standing in front of the door. On the two seater to my right is a middle-aged man reading a book whose language I cannot make out. It looks like it might be Cyrillic. Wait, no, it's Arabic or Persian. No, it's Cyrillic. I take my glasses off thinking that this will give me a sharper view. It doesn't. It seems to keep changing. The man is not reading on an electronic device, but a printed book. Is it possible that printed matter on a page can keep, keep shifting from Cyrillic to a Middle Eastern alphabet? Part four, I'm again standing by the door and across from me is a young woman seated and reading a book that is clearly giving her great pleasure. She is smiling and positively glowing with each page. But here's the, the odd thing. She has only the middle section of a paperback, front and back covers, first and final chapters, all missing. She turns a page and it falls off. She's clearly done with this page. Rather than let it fall to the floor, car floor, she stuffs it into her bag. I respect that. More pages will fall off. How do I know this? She is picking at the adhesive binding, which is exposed. The title wore off or fell off long ago. I'll never know what book she was reading that so entertained her or why she had only the middle section. She is reading, beaming, and picking at the glue, getting a piece off, and rolling it between her thumb and forefinger. If I ever meet her and we become friends, I'll buy her a new copy. Part six, it is evening. The couple are in their mid forties and clearly into each other. They have come from some kind of corporate event as each one is carrying a swag bag that has printed on it, Northeast regional something or other. I get the feeling that they have known each other slightly before and that perhaps each attended this event in the hope that the other would be there. He's Italian and she's Russian, so they are speaking in their only common language, English. He tells her how hard it is to start dating again after a divorce, and she is sympathetic since she is also divorced, but also firm that he has to move on and put the past behind him. It is evident that she would like to help him in this effort. As my stop approaches, she looks him in the eye and asks shyly, please, what is your horror sign? Part seven, another evening, he is a hunk a dead ringer for the model Fabio, whose image has graced the covers of many romance novels. Maybe he is Fabio. She is far from being his equal in the looks department, chubby and plain of face tending towards downright homely. And he loves her deeply. They've come from some kind of event that looks at least semi-formal. He is wearing a ruffled shirt reminiscent of a Vegas lounge singer, and she is dressed in some sort of a gown. She is sleeping deeply against his massive chest and shoulder. He supports her head with one hand. At a certain point, she half wakes up and asks him something, and he gently strokes her hair and shushes him, her back to slumberland. She means the world to him, that much is obvious. There are several sleek New York City women in this car, two of them with exercise mats strapped to their backs. They are clearly coming from or going to some place where they will strengthen their cores the looks of incomprehension and incredulity on their faces as they watch this couple are priceless. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Very thorough. Lots of stuff. Okay. Um, while, is, while Holly Hep Galvin, Hip Holly Hep Galvin is unmuting herself, I'll just let you know that next up would be Mike Logan on deck. Okay. Big Mike Logan. So is Holly there? Yes, I'm ready. Okay. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you fine. Thanks. Okay. All old ladies have good stories, but mine is better than most. You see, I was Little Red Riding Hood. Yes, people all over the world have heard how I set off in the woods in my red cloak, bearing a basket of goodies for my grandmother. It's strange, though. 
No one ever asks what became of Little Red Riding Hood. No one ever asks what happens after she emerged from the hot, sticky furnace of the wolf's belly and was forced to watch as the huntsman filled him with stones. It was a gruesome thing, really. The huntsman kept carrying them in, armful after armful from Granny's garden. He made me hold the wolf's front paws while Granny held the back. And even after the wolf was full of stones, still he brought in more, laughing as he shoved them around the wolf's heart and onto his liver, smiling as he squeezed sharp pebbles by his spleen. Why? Why answer cruelty with cruelty? You have saved two lives. Why weigh down another's? But even as it grew dark, the huntsman persisted. He was a brutal man with one eye that had been picked clean by a woodpecker. And when he couldn't see outside, he started putting in pieces of my granny's pottery, small bowls and china cups with pictures of cherries, milk glass swans, and ceramic dancers with their arms upraised. Piece by piece, he wedged them into the wolf's wet insides, tiny squirrel figurines and cherubs with harps. The wolf was silent the whole time. He stayed completely still and watched me with his big black eyes. Only once did I hear him murmur. And when I bent down to those great white teeth, I heard him say just one word, mercy. Eventually the huntsman was done. He went over to Granny's sewing box and took a needle and thread to sew up the needle, the wolf's belly. He made big, ugly stitches that strained against the swollen pink skin. And then somehow the wolf managed to drag himself out of the college and down to the river. But what people don't know is that the wolf didn't drown that day, nor the next. He just lay there in the cold water with his paw holding onto a rock. He lay there with his swollen belly and his wet fur. He lay there motionless and gazed at the sky. I went to visit him most days. I don't know why. It was something about his stillness, his heaviness. We just sat together and listened to the water gurgling and watched the trees swaying in the breeze. And then one day the wolf said, I'm hungry. And it didn't strike me as strange because wolves are always hungry. It's their nature but I didn't know what to feed him because I didn't want to kill another animal. So I reached into the river and pulled out a smooth stone. And without a word, the wolf opened his mouth and swallowed it. After that, I, I started feeding him a new stone each day. It became my mission, my passion to find the best stones. I searched everywhere. I brought him shiny stones with bits of silver. I brought him small speckled stones like bird's eggs. I brought him smooth stones and pitted stones and stones with rings. I brought him stones with stripes of color and ones that were jet black. I searched all over the countryside and through the woods. As I got older, I took trains to new towns and found stones that had tumbled down from mountains. In other countries, I found stones that had traveled in glaciers or been hacked out of a mine. I found stones that had been in boys' pockets and stones that had been thrown during protests. And one day, when I was about the age Granny had been, I went to the river to find the wolf so weighed down with stones that only the tip of his nose and his eyes were above the water. He was monstrously huge at that point, like a fallen tree, like a gray boulder. He filled the river from bank to bank, and only his tail swished in the current. At that moment, I knew the story needed to end that we both needed to let go. So I took a pair of scissors and carefully cut the old stitches on the wolf's belly. And as soon as I did, his skin sprang back and the stones heaved upward. There was a mountain of stones. And I waded into the river and started taking them out. One by one, I reached in and collected them. The shiny ones and the gray ones and the ones with holes. I piled them all around me the round ones and the smooth ones and the ones like little embryos with their eyes just forming. It took me over a year, but finally I got close to his heart. And then I started pulling out the original stones from Granny's garden and the china cups and the little squirrel figurines. I carefully pulled them all out and placed them beside me. 
And when I pulled out the last one, the wolf heaved a huge sigh. His body now floated lightly on the top of the water. His great belly was empty. And without a word, he let go of the bank with his paw. He let go and instantly the current swept him downstream. He floated lighty, lightly and easily, his body turning in circles and rocking from side to side. He floated like a leaf, like a feather, like a torn page from a book. He floated down the river and out of sight. And as I watched him go, I thought that this, this is how the story should end. Thank you. Thank you, Holly. Great story, thank you. Okay, um, is Big Mike Logan there? Is he ready? Can he unmute himself? And um, after Big Mike, it will be Ron Combe. Can we find Mike Logan? Sometimes. Will you not allow me to unmute? Oh, got it, okay. Yes, you got it, unmute yourself. Go, Mike. Okay. okay, got it. Czech Republic, Republic. Can a stripper from the Czech Republic be legally entitled to the status of my girlfriend? If so, then I'm fucking around behind my topless dancer girlfriend's back. I sacrificed my neighbor's little black toy poodle Fifi to the chief Tutana god Wotan, praying for the Valhalla Almighty to send me a new girlfriend. Don't worry, my dog loving neighbor is a Satanist, so she'll understand. Just uh, don't say anything about it to her. Then Freya, the pagan love goddess, sent me a 99-pound anorexia nervosa Eastern European stripper with no tits and a big fat ass, better known as Gigi, the girl of my dreams. She resembles a 12-year-old prepubescent Catholic schoolgirl. Again, don't worry. She's 25 years old. I checked out her passport and student visa. She's studying business at NYU, working her way through college, giving lap dances and hand jobs in the VIP champagne room of New York Dolls Strip Club in Tribeca. She's got ambitions for a better life. So tonight, I'll go to their sister strip club, Flash Dance, in Midtown, just to avoid running into Gigi. I'm cheating on Gigi with a transgender Thai topless dancer with this huge set of fake silicone tits and the tiny soft behind of a 10-year-old boy. Not that I would ever know what a 10-year-old boy's body feels like. I'm just saying, just don't say anything to Gigi if you see her. Why? Why do I cheat on Gigi? I suppose even among strippers, variety is the spice of life. I fucked around behind the back of each of my previous four ex-wives, so why should now be different? Do I owe monogamy, fidelity to a sex worker? I never told Gigi, Gigi to quit her job blowing out-of-town businessmen in the high-end sapphire room of New York Doll. I don't judge her. Why should she judge me? But having dated strippers, porn stars, dominatrices, escorts, call girls, happy ending massage parlor masseuses, go-go dancers, and burlesque queens, I have painfully discovered that these sex workers are just as inclined, if not more so, to be insanely jealous of my extramarital affairs. They demand absolute fidelity, I suppose, because they are exposed to men who are blatantly cheating on a wife or a girlfriend with them. I'm a Gemini. That's why I'm so jealous. D, the escort erotic massage porn star, confronted me after she caught me merely dirty dancing with some female downtown poet. Suffice it to say, our relationship did not survive. So if you run into Gigi sometime and she starts asking you a bunch of questions about me, like where was I, what was I doing, or who I was doing with, with just tell her, I was with you, Mr. Murphy. <laughs> that was, uh, thank you very much, Big Mike. Nice to see you again. Big Mike Wallflower, that was. Okay, thank you. Yeah, cheers. So, um, is Ron Combe up there? Is he ready to unmute himself? And Thanks. after that, it will be John S. Hall reading uh, Steve Dalachinsky's piece. Black Snake Moan? Okay, Ron Combe's here. Yeah, let's go, Ron. Black Snake Moan. The Standing Rock Sioux had a bad dream, and that dream was of a big black snake, and they all knew right away what their dream meant, and it did not mean something good. They knew that, too. 
who Sue took this dream as a warning, a warning that outsiders were going to poison their water, that their water was about to be cursed. This water was the Lake Oahe and the snake was the Dakota Access Pipeline and the blood that filled this black snake and that made the snake evil was oil. The lifeblood still of the non-native folks who surround the Cheyenne River Re Reservation from sea to polluted sea. The same non-native Americans who had taken their land so many years ago and who continued to destroy it right up to this very day, even though everyone knows better because the good folks of Bismarck, North Dakota all had dreams too, but their dreams were different. There were no snakes in their dreams unless they were dreaming about sex. In their no dreaming life, they had pushed the black snake some distance away because on some level, even they knew that the black snake was death and they had the power to keep it away from their water, but not so far away that they couldn't suck blood out of it from time to time. Their way of life depended on it. Many years ago, old blues musicians sang about the black snake, but to them, it meant something else. It meant sex and life not death, but the Sioux know that now it doesn't mean sex or life, it only means they're getting screwed. The black snake kept slithering closer and soldiers and police came to protect it and the way of death and life it represented. But then other Native Americans and kind folks from all over this country arrived to keep the snake at bay and to protect a way of life that had been disappearing for so many years, creating a standoff. And then 2,000 armed volunteers, some of the members of Black Lives Matter, and some who were military vets showed up to stand shoulder to shoulder with the Standing Rock Sioux. And this gave pause to the great black father who was more or less running the country. And he said, let the snake go elsewhere. We can work something out. But he was replaced by a very evil huckster who undid this great notion and said, no, I like the great black snake. Let it crawl all over this land. And his tiny white snake stood up or tried to stand up and cheer. And thank God that great white father is our great white father no more. <laughs> thank you. Okay, thank you, Ron. Cheers. Nice to see you again, Ron. Thanks. Thank you very much. Okay, um, so John is going to read Steve Dalich. Sorry, I'm getting Steve Dalachinsky's piece. Steve is no longer with us. The impish Steve. I'm uh, sorry, but uh, John, are you there? Are you ready? You unmute yourself. This is Afterglow by Steve Dalachinsky. I put some words uh, about him in the chat. Okay. Afterglow. The sun's afterglow stretches across the river like a body surfer. The river, a constantly moving body, disperses the light across its rippling skin. The sun creates as much light as it does shadow. The light thins as night's shadow stretches across the river. The river no longer impresses the runners. The runners no longer run by the river's edge. Clouds obscure day's end. Obscure are the no longer panting dogs. The pre-ancient bard conducting the river's currents. Currently, it is that time after the world has ended. And her smile as she passes does not seem like a blind woman's smile. I sit on a bench made of steel and wood. After the world as we know it has come to an end. As the afterglow fades with her face into evening. And her smile and this bench and the big red W on the other side of the river no longer exist and the Queen of Hearts and all the other party boats no longer exist. And, high, and the highway behind me that often would sound like an ocean has fallen silent as I have, for it and I no longer exist. But of all the passersby I've seen, and I've seen a lot before the world as we knew it came to an end, that smile on a stranger's lips endured. And I almost could have endured the end of the world because of that smile and the now faded afterglow. But my memory ended when I did, and I ended when the world did, along with so much else. And now, not even an umbrellas no longer openly catch the rain, nor will the morning's greenery fetch even a grin. Thanks, and I'll be on a little bit later with my own thing. Thanks, John, for reading that. Thank you. Okay, I see Creighton Blinn has arrived. Um, is he ready now to read? Just has to mute, unmute himself. Yeah, I can go now. Okay, nice to see you, Crane. You go now. Nice, nice cool. to see you. Sorry about the delay. Sorry oh, about hold on a minute. Um, and after Crane, then Jennifer Harmon um, goes back, please. Okay, go on, Crane. I'm good. Okay, sorry. Just sorry for the um, delay. Right. Um, but I'm ready to do my piece now from the book. 
And um, thank you everyone for organizing the, this and putting this together today. Um, Monday evening, East 14th Street, around 10 o'clock. The used ice tumbles into plastic tubs, clinking like the discarded glasses swept up by the server as she deftly avoids the bases, poised just a little too far from the singer, bravely competing the din of conversations bouncing against each other. Co connections made, strengthened, abandoned. Dialogues winding down another Monday, mixed from equal parts yelp and yawn and stirred into that perpetual tease that this is the one where everything finally falls into place. Thank you. Thanks, Graham. Cheers. Nice to see you again. Nice one. Right, so um, is Jennifer Harmon Gersbeck ready? Is she unmute herself? Hello. All right. Hi, Jennifer. And after Jennifer, it'll be Lionel. Hi. Okay. After Jennifer will be lying. All right then, Jennifer. You can go ahead. Okay, great. Can you guys hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, great. All right, light and dark. It's deep down inside me from long ago, not channeled at him, my dad, little Jenny or God, me. Yes, of course it's channeled at that us. Rage boobs within me. Rage booms with. Oh, me. Rage blooms with anger in the desert and covered it with beautiful magenta flowered cats. I cut my the sharp needles of self doubt, labeling myself average, unorganized, chubby. Oh, goodbye, goodbye. Fuck that. I am mesmerizing. Growing up, I was angry about his infidelity, her blindness, what I could not control. Rage blooms within me. Rage blooms within me. My eyes are swirl, metallic. My eyes are about to pull or pink. I roll over. I soak in faith to relax sore muscles. I leave with a natural shine. Take all of me, take all of me, New York. Triumph is built on going there. I have to go there. I go there to rage blooms within me. I am proud to make this grand announcement. I make this grand announcement every day, every day. Proud to say the day arrived when I rest. I rescued myself, I'm capable. Of I have to tell you, thank you for loving me. Thank you for showing me love. Thank you for letting me be real and true. Thank you for not holding my frustration and anger against me. Thank you for letting me be authentic. You have taught me about truth. Thank you for letting me do exactly what I need to do, what I needed to do, what I need to do every day. Thank you, Philip, and my my beautiful silver tongue devils, my fellow silver tongue de devils, I love you. I love mixing my mom's poetry and mine. I love mixing my dad with my own truths. I am becoming a grief counselor. I will become a grief counselor to children and teen and adults. Dad, thank you for walking me down the aisle. Thank you for sharing your art with me in New York City. Even though you both aren't physically here, I love you. And I will continue to share our story with the world. Thank you, Philip. I love you guys and miss you so much. Thanks, Jennifer. Thank you very much. I think that was our first alfresco poem today. Although, you know, some people had backdrops they were pretending, but thank you very much. All right, so um, is Lionel ready? Lionel LaVert Hansen, are you there? Can you unmute yourself? And after Lionel, I just want to let uh, Maria Lacella know that she'll be up next and she's going to read two poems. So, okay, Lionel, you're ready to go. All right, hello, everyone. This is called The Magical Man. Sandilla's eyes darted between her wine and her smartphone. Brady had said it was over, but he had said that before. That would have been a week and still no response. Sandilla didn't want to believe that. 
Brady was her man, tall, athletically built, and a corporate lawyer. Brady was everything a socially ambitious, yet politically moderate girl could want. He was polite to friends. He impressed her parents. He was really good at foreplay. He was as perfect as any Jewish guy with a waspy demeanor could be. Then Lizette Negron came into the picture. Lizette Negron, that fucking bitch from Mount Vernon. She was his legal secretary for Christ's sake. Tandela knew that something might be up, but she couldn't be sure. Then she saw the Facebook picture. It was Brady and Lizette embracing at some Sociedad Latina party somewhere in Manhattan. They were both covered in sweat from salsa dancing. The thing that got her wasn't that, it was how ecstatic Brady looked. He looked the kind of happy he never did before. Candilla didn't get it. She had planned a beautiful getaway to Longwood Gardens outside of Philly. Brady claimed he was into horticulture and botany and all that shit. So why wasn't he more excited? She just didn't get anything anymore. Candilla pushed the sadness away by reaching for another glass. She was up to her fourth. The bartender couldn't help but notice. Experience had told him this wasn't going to end well, but he was game to please the young lady. Maybe he felt sorry for her. He was glad she was ordering Riesling instead of Chardonnay. Either way, he had the next bottle ready to go. The wine wasn't working for Sandilla. Nothing was working for her now. She had called her girlfriend Mindy, but Mindy was spending the weekend with her boyfriend in Pennsylvania. Brady had killed their double date. Gulped another swig. The bartender's fingers practically caressed the bottle's cork. Then a guy squeezed past Sandilla and ordered three beers. The bartender ditched the wine and started pouring the pints. The young man excused himself when he first saw Sandilla, but his smile took her back. It was a broad, bright, irony-free smile she hadn't felt in years. Sandilla scanned the bar area. She saw he was alone. She couldn't help herself. So, you're gonna have all those beers by yourself? Well, the bartender said there's a minimum credit card payment, so I thought, why not catch up with some drinking? Sandilla thought about teasing him for being an alcoholic, but after four wines, she might not have a barstool leg to stand on. So she zipped it and smiled back. The guy smiled again and carried his drinks back to his seat. Sandilla couldn't help but look. He was excitedly typing on his laptop. He looked like a child who had found the essential secret to life. And every now and then, when not typing, when not smiling or swaying or drinking, he looked up and aimed his eyes straight at her. She saw he was handsome by the light of his laptop. Normally, she would have waited. She would have made the man come to her. But now she didn't care. She also wanted to know, what the hell was that boy writing about anyway? Why was he smiling so much? Sandilla couldn't wait anymore. She closed her tab, tipped the bartender, and strode to his table. She sat down right across from him, her bright brown eyes hooking up with his. For a moment, she paused. Then Sandilla turned her head to the side, all curious. So what are you writing about on that laptop? The young man smiled yet again. It was a short story. It's about this girl. She's at a bar, checking her phone in frustration waiting for a life to change. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, the loquacious Lionel. Thank you very much. So uh, is Maria Lucella there? She's going to read. She is there. Hi, Maria. Nice She's to see you. Here. <laughs> going to read two. A little, little wardrobe change. Um, OK, I'm going to read my piece first. Yes, just go ahead. Yeah, go okay. ahead. The Urban Disappeared. Acrid smells, acid steel, burn wires, crisp black carbon on an iron pan. Whites of eyes shone red, throats lined with pulverized steel, bone. Ghosts walk among us, living inside the living, walking forever wounded. They march in perfect step at rush hours, up and down Broadway, Church Street, east on Fulton, up the steps of St. Paul's. They stand on lines at coffee carts, keep time-worn routines at appointed hours. Silent, invisible, in day, in night. The urban disappeared, float in and out of twin tower cavities. A cosmos of thick, visible air, no longer served by elevators. 
sip steaming coffee at desks. Clouds rise above lips, stare sky, stare into sky in space. Mouths open to call spouses, no one hears them. Peer into photos on desks, seek exit, escape, egress, infinite frames replay September 11th, stuttering into the 21st century. Um, this is Gil's poem. I'm just gonna put a note about Gil in there. I think I did. Did I? Sorry. Okay. I'm just going to Gil's. Let's see. Sorry. Just. You guys are gonna kill me. Yeah. Sorry, I had to call it up. Night of the Hot Hoagie by Gil Fajani. Every night, chest out, face shiny, brigade shot Sergeant Samuel L. Silverman bursts into my room, 10 p.m. hunger hour, while I stand forward, gut in, shoulders back, quivering like a half palsy. Sergeant Silverman sniffs around for a Philly style hoagie sandwich, cheese steak, shrimp salad, hamburger, Italian. He opens drawers, looks in coat pockets, lifts up blankets and sheets, when he finds a hoagie, confiscates, half declaring R-H-I-P. Rank has its privileges. As the big knot in his throat works itself up and down, half my precious sandwich disappears down his gullet. Fed up with being ripped off, I order an Italian flamethrower from Fran and Nan's hoagie shop. Prosciutto, salami, and provolone, all three layers larded with Tabasco, Louisiana hot sauce, and cherry peppers. The next evening, Sergeant Silverman bursts into my room, picking up the scent of hoagie. I make no attempt to hide it this time. After the first few bites, Sarge roars and runs off to the latrine where he latches his lips around the cold water faucet. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Maria. Thanks for doing it. Okay. So um, Patricia Carrigan is next. Uh, she was asking me and I couldn't re respond. So... Are you there, Patricia? Yes. You can go ahead then. I'm reading from the anthology. Oh, great. More. Reach out for a moment. I look into the water's eyes, see your face where mine ought to be. It rises to the surface, diverts me from a future hidden in uncertainty. Your kindness mesmerizes my tears welcomed guests. Your voice rises from the water, tears this veil spun from sadness. You speak of life after death, of mending a damaged spirit, of how innocence erases time from the hourglass of life, of a world reborn in love and freedom untouched by history's impact where sorrow rose from smoke. I watch the smoke fade as light cuts its veil. Together, we leave history by the harbor doorstep. We reach out for the moment, touch in light's seduction. We rise as one entity. We resurrect as love. Thank you. Thank you very much, Patricia. Thank you. So uh, our next reader is Art Gatti, and um, it might come as a shock. I don't know if he knows the list. <laughs> so uh, okay, well, I got it. Yeah. Uh, right. So while you're unmuting, um, I would just say Vogue is after Art Gatti. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Back in 70, 1972, my wife, uh, my singer wife, and I dragged our six-week-old baby to a Grateful Dead concert and doomed her to become a singer. And so I stole some lines from a Grateful Dead song about this, which is her, her child, her only child, little boy. I'm a 70 year old grandfather and he was four or five when I wrote this. Uh, it's called Crash. Knock them young bones against the old, 
boy child jumping on grandpa's lap, crunching thigh bones, riding like the wind. I know you ride are gonna miss me when I'm gone. No sense of life, no thought of endings, just being. First night followed by day and the inevitable next night. I know you right are going to miss me when I'm gone. A face, a presence, a stubbly beard. Feel a feeling of grandpa. I know you right are going to miss me when I'm gone. Cheers, uh, what bop Nice to see you again. Okay, thanks. Um, so Vio, Vogue Jambri, no relation to me anyway, is up next. Are you there, Vogue? If you can unmute yourself. And then after Vogue, it's Jerry T. Johnson. Am I here? Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you now. Yeah, go okay. ahead. Okay. Um, this one's called, Sometimes I Think of Eating Jazz on Monday Mornings. I'm undecided. Tell me, have you thought anything about the anatomy of a murder? My mood is repulsive and what a hangover I reel today. And yesterday you took my body and soul is something I've been thinking about. You have been away, not so far. I come over in my pajamas, peeling clementines. You hate the smell and how funny. I am dripping juice all over the couch you never sit on because Boaz fucked here. Once we cuddled when no one was home. We're only alone together. Don't make me cry. I remember all your gigs and won't you kiss me once while we're young and delusional. I promise there will never be another you. Broke my typewriter trying to fix my heart hurts thinking it's so cold and you live so far away. My bike's locked downstairs. I have no key. Don't yell at me. You're always rambling about lonely women. It's not funny. Eventually I'll leave just for you. I'd stop singing honeysuckle rose and you won't hurt me like bruised knees making giant steps. It's fine. We will just be in love with each other secretly. My favorite things are those you hate playing the sax for me, like Sunny always screaming in my ear. I saw the way you looked free and Connor's coming over today. She told me how you feel silly without me. Rain check? And we're out of bird food, but that doesn't mean you can take my cereal and you're so loud with your bird calls that mean nothing. And everything sounds like it means I have no money in my pocket and you have no way home. The alternative take of you love your spell is everywhere. Thank you. Oh my God, I love you guys. <laughs> Thank you so much. That was great. Okay, is Jerry Johnson there? Is he available? Hey, yes, I'm here. Can everybody you know, wave if you can hear me? After Jerry, it'll be Amy Barone. But Jerry, go ahead, go for it. All right, I saw folks waving. I guess you can hear me. And here's my poem, a poem for the road. Today I travel by plane across the country, whether by plane, whether by train, whether by ship. I enjoy a sense of adventure. This morning I'm at O'Hare on my way to Detroit. And as I stand at my gate, gazing at my surroundings, I spot an interesting and a remarkable sight. There's a young man seated at a, at the ta at a table in a, con at a coffee shop, facing the, course, the concourse, typing on a typewriter. He's typing away on a beautiful blue as a cloudless morning sky typewriter. Of course, I can't help myself. I stop by and I say hello. I tell him, you know, you're going to attract a pack of tourists banging away on that thing like that. Smiling a broad smile, he says, I certainly hope so. Then I tell him, well, right on, you writing warrior, right on. He tells me he is writing letters while he awaits his flight. We talk about writing poetry and prose. We shake hands as I depart for it's time for me to board. And as I walk, my legs no longer wobbly from the, tr from the trekking of the concourse. My heart no longer heavy 
from the weight of commerce. My mind no longer tense from the strain of planning. My eyes no longer drowsy from rising far too early. I move towards the gate door. I feel a, sh a tap on my shoulder. Uh, it's the young man standing there, smelling that big broad smile again, holding a folded piece of paper in his hand, saying, here's a poem for the road. Mm. Thank you. Thank you, Jerry. Nice to see you. Okay. Is um, Amy there? Yes. Okay, Amy, you're on the ball. All go. right. Oh, after, this is... after Amy, sorry, sorry, is Pete Tamara. Okay. Go ahead, Amy, sorry. Uh, this is called Message. She hovered outside my bedroom window one late steamy morning in July. I barely recognized her with wings spinning, nose pratting, as I pondered whether to begin the day, but she vanished and my mind drifted further until August when she returned, singing from her bright blue throat as if an urgency awaited. My mother relished nature's dance from this window. She saved news clippings of successful writers from my visits. A petite sugar lover who fiercely guarded her nest, loved music, revisited to relay a message. I continue to decode. Thank you. Thank you. Serene as ever. Thank you. <laughs> okay, next is Peter Mara, if he can uh, unmute himself. And after yeah, hi. You hear me? It's Karee Spencer. Okay, Peter, go ahead. Okay, this piece is called Forgotten Incidents, A Bad Friend, A Good Crucifixion. Blood moon, bang, bang, a face, the sweet body in recent years. The hands of these gestures were rising from the streets to the stations of our cross. We're bleeding, a holy moisture for our forgotten prey, the mischief of a touch, a lick of the lips instead of our prayers. It contorted with the pleasure and lightly tongued the window pane. The creature could not be defined by standard scientific exploratory techniques. So the cage door was left open for it to escape. Evolution, for us to forget it existed. Opening scene, Dromo Square, Florence. Violinist, she appears in the back. Olive skin, long black hair, tattered dress. She glides without movement. Transfiguration, a video undergoing experimental climaxes manipulated by vacant stairs. We're never going to leave this place, are we? The skin of stucco, this void that throbs. The moon spins left whenever she enters the room, passing from one room to another, clasping a random heart in her left hand. Making a mano fico with her right paw, she wears a vest of horsehair and nothing else. Her sex is on display. Inconsequential meanderings brought her to this present state, not satiated, singing gentle songs right before the ritual starts. The slender female strangers mouth words of unknown origin as they walk cobblestone streets, coarse words from their father's corpses, eternal high contrast, black and white burns up the monitor. Listen, the conversations of females, a carrier of tiny flesh scratches while titillating the evening sky, loneliness cured by a black box waiting for us to enter. Say prayers to the Madonna, say prayers to St. Jude in plain sight, eyes turned inwards to admire the footprints, wandering helter-skelter, she caressed the vintage movie box before licking her only window. They scream without vocal cords, a mutation of what had really occurred in the past, the never spoken, the never seen, and the babble. The wandering feminine mirrors clutched a broken face close to their hearts. The pupae stole the faces of the wife and reclaimed them for its own. She professed her love of cocoons. The echo locating of lunar moths intrigued these women. The direction of light during the totemic ceremonies gave them no satisfaction. Another came in for the kill. Thank you. Thanks, Peter. Thank you very much. Very sci fi. Where, where are you? <laughs> <laughs> All right. So next up is Karee Spencer. Karee, are you there? Yes, I am. Okay. Can you after, hear me? Yes, can I hear you fine. Yes. Not for you. It's going to be Austin Alexis. Okay. Bye. Okay. A Broken Heart on East 7th Street. Our managers at 7A Cafe allow me to feed homeless people day-old bread and leftover home fries during my daytime waitressing shift. 
In the late 1980s, 7A Cafe is across the street from Tompkins Square Park. So we're right in the midst of the homeless population and park squatters. When I hand out leftover French bread and potatoes, a few of the homeless men offer responses such as, does the bread come with a free beer? Because the Hare Krishnas always give us something to drink like Kool-Aid. There's a man who when offered bread, like a great Shakespearean actor, dramatically grabs his stomach and says, I cannot digest bread, only meat, medium rare, with an ounce of liquor. I have one regular homeless customer, an old man who spends his days pacing up and down 7th Street between Avenue A and 1st Avenue, never going beyond the block. He walks, appearing to contemplate life with his hands clasped behind his back like a monk, sometimes stopping to peer up at a building and shading his eyes. He's grizzled, covered in several layers of clothes, with the last layer being a huge gray army trench coat, like the kind Sergeant Schultz wore on the TV show Hogan's Heroes. He wears a wool, a wool cap and army issue boots with many plastic shopping bags stuffed into them. What's your name? I asked the man one day. He replies in a foreign language, or is it gibberish? He walks away from me, then goes up to a nearby parking sign and shakes a finger at it, continuing to speak in this unknown language. The only time he seems to become lucid and speaks a few words of English is to make sure I get his food order right. In fact, he doesn't care if I'm in the middle of taking a paying customer's order. He'll tap me on the shoulder if I'm in the outside cafe. And when I turn around, he says, now, miss food, I eat. I hold up a finger and mouth the words, okay, one minute. He nods yes vigorously and walks away. But a moment later, I feel that familiar tap tap on my shoulder. I try to ignore him until my customer tells me my homeless friend is back. I turn and he says again, Miss, no, eat. He just won't leave me alone until I fix his bag of food. Since he won't tell me through trial and error, I've figured out his precise order five pieces of French bread, five pats of butter, and three grape jelly packets. Two napkins join all of this in a plastic to-go bag. The first few times I just dump a handful of bread, butter, and jelly into a paper bag. He opens it, counts everything, then either hands me back extra items or holds up an item and says, more, more. Once I get it right, I give it to him but he hands the bag right back to me. No, it's for you, not me, I say, holding it out to him. He says something I don't understand while pointing repeatedly down towards his feet. You want the bread and butter in your boots? I snap at him, then glance over at the customers in my section, holding up their empty coffee cups for refills. I sigh and wave the paper bag at him again. No, no. No, he says, as he pushes the bag back into my direction. Then he bends over and pulls on the many plastic bags poking out of his boots. I have no time to do pantomime with a homeless man while paying customers who will leave me a 50 cent tip need my attention. I slap my forehead. Oh, you want it in a plastic bag. It turns out he has a certain distaste for paper bags. He also refuses a plastic knife as if it's an indignity and an insult to offer him a fake utensil. He wants a real stainless steel knife. I actually never see him eat the food I give him, making me think that he must go further down 7th Street to eat where I can't see him. Despite living out on the street, he seems to be a very private person. At work, he becomes known as Corey's homeless man, as if I've adopted him. When I'm not at 7A Cafe, the other waiters tell me he spends his days peering into the windows of the restaurant looking for me. 
it feels like he's some poor alley cat I've started to feed and now depends entirely on me to survive. After I moved from Brooklyn to the East Village on 11th Street, only four blocks away from 7A, I tried to stop by on my days off and feed him. Otherwise, he drives everyone crazy. If I can't make it, I'm greeted at my next shift by my manager, Marina, saying, your boyfriend was looking for you all yesterday. Look, Corey, you can still see the grease spot on the window where he pressed his face up against the glass. He's one of about half a dozen of my boyfriends, sad guys, some homeless, some able to afford the $1.90, $1.85 breakfast special who visit me regularly at 7A Cafe. I'm popular with the guys no one else wants to wait on. I'm gonna end it here. You can read the rest of this in the anthology. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Okay, is um, Austin Alexis ready? Can you unmute yourself, Austin? Yes, I'm here. Great, after Austin, it will be Begonia Plaza. So go ahead, Austin. This is called Needs. She wanted a lover, one who would not give her any diseases, who would not resent her successes, who wouldn't turn into a gargoyle or a moon desert or a mirage, one who would teach her how to relax and enjoy the world. One who would be there for her at her life's inevitable sunset. But when he finally arrived, lit up with green and easefulness, she sensed something else she craved was missing, a thing she couldn't name or even envision. Thank you. Thanks, Austin. Short and sweet. Thank you very much. So, um, Begonia Plaza, and then after Begonia will be Bert Baroff. Are you there, Begonia? Yes. Okay, we can hear you. That's all right. Go ahead. Love is the one found to rise above not a power tool to be used by the cruel fool upon weaker ridiculed and unschooled. Love is strength, God, courage, yet hard to know love unless you show your woes, foes, and what you intend to sow. In love, don't play the hero who purrs because your favors just might not be hers. Part of love is sex, but if intercourse disturbs to perplex Amongst uninterested strangers rushing to circumflex an itch, an ache, a burning rush without even a tender crush, just the desire for a violent with a chew, a suck, and to let out the gush. While this act can lead to more, the escapist and addicted think they can buy love at the candy store, like a craving tended to for which they implore, yet found in the thoughtful whore is a carefree heart, with capacity to adore, shackled about evermore. She's unrestrained, not making love a chore, even though disdained. The sore have a decadent heart, with for compassion, unwilling to restore empathy. Instead, they go for war, luring density, yet lacking fidelity, chasing after necessity, void of clemency, hungry for a freebie. They blindly misplace the key to cross the soul's boundary. Bodies hold on, suspicious and afraid. The heart might be swayed, betrayed, or preyed upon like a delayed blockade after reluctantly having pain away. The favor never feels conveyed except for feeling played. The victimized fear being underpaid, launching a crusade of lust and disgust driven by mistrust in the banal, hushed, unloved canal of agitated recreation, where the ultimate revelation is degradation, speculation, and the final resignation returns love to starvation. Love is to be shared and not an obligation leading to accusation, as if you didn't have fun, 
Otherwise, why didn't you run before the devastation? Love begins from within. Hold up chin, check the skin. Otherwise, go on a tailspin, turning and turning in, into a mannequin. Heart pain is different in that you feel you've gained. Even the flame, for truth has no shame nor anyone to blame. That dance is a generous act, a free expression, smack with a balancing of torment and suspense for a final recompense of spiritual consequence. Loving and being loved is the joy where two hearts ploy not to destroy their paper toy, linking delicately together through stormy or sunny weather, free like a feather, traveling skin to skin, innocent of sin, hearing the sounds of a violin playing Chopin's fantasy impromptu in a moment or in East Berlin, no matter, the adventure's about to undo what you thought you already knew. Relearn that love goes beyond the casual screw as the alchemical mix of time and space has nothing to fix but serve love its final brew. Eyes alive without disguise, fluent sighs intermingled with ancient outcries between ardent allies without compromise or the need to fantasize are the vulnerable powers unprivatized and deathless, aware the reflective presence is transformative and gracious in the moment of parting and said you. The symphony was real, the bond stronger than steel. Love was expressed through and through. Neither one was dormant, but engaged, connected in their rendezvous, forever imprinted in memory like a tattoo, though tough, still love was enough. Thank you. Thank you very much. Glad you're here. Um, anyway, I'm going to sign off now. Great to um, introduce to those that I did and listen to you and see you again. Um, I'm going to hand off to Linda uh, after she's read her piece. Uh,